This is Woodhouse Estate, a domain in County Waterford on the southeast coast of Ireland. An estate of grasslands and woodlands with a large Georgian house, cottages and outbuildings. It is a beautiful land, full of natural resources and crossed by the River Tay, which ends at Stradbally Cove on the Celtic Sea. The history of Woodhouse and Stradbally begins in the 13th century with the arrival of the Normans. People were already living in this area. As far back as 150 AD, Ptolemy identified them as the Brigantes. 5th and 6th century AD archaeological remains, such as ring forts, suterans, promontory forts, Ecclesiastical enclosures and ohm stones are located in and around Woodhouse. They tell the story of a people that lived here since the end of prehistory. They were the Dacia Moon, a tribe most likely of Gaulish origins. The Dacia Moon formed their own small regional kingdom. For centuries they were under the influence of the kings of Cashel, whom they supported in battle and paid tribute to. They cultivated the soil, raised cattle, exploited the forests and rivers, and smelted copper. Their names have travelled to us, carved in own stones. The area adopted its inhabitants' names and became known as Dacia. From the 7th century onwards, the Dacia Moon got involved in the permanent political conflicts of the Irish chieftains for control of the south of Ireland and against the Viking raiders. Until one day, the Normans set foot in Ireland. After the arrival of the Normans in the late 12th century, many townlands were given by the English kings to the Anglo-Norman knights. The Fitzgeralds were granted the lands where Woodhouse estate lies today. In 1215, King John of England made Thomas Fitz Anthony the custodian of the Fitzgeralds' lands. He founded the village of Stradbally where he erected a church Very soon, along with the nearby cities of Waterford, Dungarvan and Lismore, Stradbally became an influential and powerful administrative centre in Waterford with its own market day. For generations, the Fitzgeralds ruled this territory through successive grants from the kings of England. In 1298, the name Tignaquilla House in the Woods, appears for the first time in Thomas Fitzmaurice Fitzgerald's last will. There must have been a structure in Woodhouse at that time. No trace of that structure remains. During more than 500 years of Fitzgerald ownership of these lands, there was one person who made a major impact on Woodhouse. His name was James Wallace, an English Protestant and a Munster settler. Around 1602, he leased Woodhouse and the neighbouring lands for 99 years. He built a fine stone house, a mill, a good orchard and garden, and many outbuildings. He introduced salmon weirs in the River Tay, cultivated the fertile lands and reared cattle. He and his wife lived in the new house and they were committed to making Woodhouse 
a prosperous domain. However, in 1641, the Irish Catholics rose up against the presence of the Protestant settlers in Munster and Ulster. Wallace was forced to abandon Woodhouse and his property was stolen or destroyed. The court granted Wallace the right to return to Woodhouse, but he chose not to avail of it. The Fitzgerald era came to an end when in 1724, a heavily indebted Major Richard MacThomas Fitzgerald sold Woodhouse to his relative, Thomas Uniac, the Alderman of Yule, for £8,400. Woodhouse was then a largely derelict structure and a run-down estate of almost 3,000 acres. Soon, a fashionable Georgian house replaced the Elizabethan remains, and in 1742, Thomas's son and heir, Morris Uniac, developed the estate by planting more than 150,000 trees of various species. Morris bequeathed Woodhouse in 1743, a year later, to his only surviving son, Bar Uniac who preferred to live in the Red House in Yall, where he was the bailiff. Upon Barr's death in 1777, his eldest son, Robert Uniac, Member of Parliament for Yall, inherited Woodhouse. In 1776, he had already commissioned the cartographer Bernard Scalet to survey Woodhouse and create a book of maps of the estate. Its content depicts the domain with hand-drawn details. This book of maps is a unique and invaluable source of knowledge about this transitional period when Woodhouse and its environ were profoundly transformed. Strad Valley Town became part of the domain of Woodhouse, which changed the dynamics of the whole area. This survey shows that Woodhouse consisted of just under 2,400 acres at that time. The Uniac landlords built new buildings, including a Protestant church in the grounds of the ruined medieval church in Stradbally. In 1790, Robert Uniac married Annette Constantia Beresford. The marriage helped his illustrious political, social and military career, as the Beresfords were one of the most powerful families in Ireland. Robert, however, didn't successfully manage his own financial affairs. Shortly before his death, he had to lease the property to a consortium of the Beresfords. When Robert Uniac died in 1802, his widow Annette was left to raise eight children in a largely indebted and impoverished woodhouse. Her daughter Nanette left us with the first known visual depiction of the house. In 1805, Annette Constantia wed Robert Doyne of Wells House, County Wexford. Her eldest son, Robert John Unia, aged just 20 years old, distinguished himself during the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. A year later, he became the landlord of Woodhouse and in 1821 married Lady Mildred Burke. They devoted themselves to the land and made Woodhouse a family home. Robert John worked to give the estate a new life. To help the postal service, a new bridge was built over the River Tay. Nearby, a schoolhouse supported by Mrs Uniac was inaugurated for boys and girls of any religious belief. The lime kilns were built at Stradbelly Cove as another source of income to finance the estate. The prospect of exploiting a copper mine was also considered. In 1851, Robert John died and his only surviving son, Robert Bohr, inherited the domain and died two years later. He was the last Uniac male heir of Woodhouse. 
the estate went to Colonel George John Beresford, who in 1844 had married Robert Bohr's eldest sister, Frances Constantia. The Beresfords made improvements in the main house and the estate. A boathouse in Stradbally Cove was built, which was let to the Coast Guard for five pounds per year. A bathhouse was also built to alleviate Colonel George's health problems. The copper mining project proved unsuccessful and was finally abandoned in 1858. In 1867, Francis Constantia and George John's eldest son, Robert Henry Beresford, inherited Woodhouse. Throughout his life, he struggled to keep it afloat. The financial difficulties due to the agrarian crisis, the land war on landowners, the lack of new sources of income, the maintenance costs of the house and estate, the creation of the Irish Land Commission, all placed him in a very difficult situation. He sold a large part of the estate. Towards the untimely end of his life, he leased the main house and stables to Claude Anson, who was married to his relative, Lady Cloda Beresford, as they wished to leave their ranch in Texas to live in Ireland. Robert Henry died as a result of a freak accident in 1903. As Robert Henry had no children, he left Woodhouse Estate to his brother, Reverend Richard Uniac Beresford, a respected rector of Inishteague, County Kilkenny. But Robert knew that Reverend Richard was a man of God and not a farmer, so he also named his other brother, John George Beresford, to be the tenant during his lifetime. However, John George lived most of his life in America and while he visited Woodhouse from time to time, he never fulfilled his brother's last wish. Both brothers died in 1925 and again, with no direct male descendants in the family, the estate passed to their youngest sister, Emily Frances Louisa. In 1911, she had married Sir Robert Hodson and lived in Hollybrook House, County Wicklow. She had no heirs, so she turned to her father's relatives, looking for the right person to take over Woodhouse. She chose Hugh, the youngest boy in the family. Lady Emily Hodson died in 1933, and Lord Hugh Tristram de la Poor Beresford became the owner of Woodhouse at the age of 25. At that time, Lord Hugh was the naval aide-de-camp to the Governor-General of South Africa. He would only see Woodhouse a year later. Even before his return to Ireland, he sent seedlings of various trees to his mother, requesting her to plant them at Woodhouse. The house soon became his home, and although the Royal Navy duties often kept him abroad, we learn from his letters that Lord Hugh constantly planned changes and improvements to his property. He was a man with a great sense of humour, deep faith, and a true understanding of what noblesse oblige meant. He was also highly respected in Woodhouse and Stradbally. In the bigger scheme of things, Lord Hugh wished to get involved in the young Irish state's politics and to contribute to the reconciliation between the Irish people and the members of the Anglo-Irish ascendancy. With this proposal in mind, he met with Antishak Eamon de Valera in August 1939 on the eve of World War II. However, before the plan could materialise, he was killed in May 1941 at the Battle of Crete as Lieutenant Commander of Destroyer HMS Kelly. His body was retrieved from the sea and buried in El Alamein Cemetery in Egypt in June 1941. Lord Hugh bequeathed Woodhouse to his elder brother, Lord William Moston de la Poor Beresford, who was serving in the British Army in India. Having survived the war, he returned to Ireland in 1944. The process of renovation and modernisation of Woodhouse is meticulously described in his records. 
Lord William put a lot of effort into running the estate and turned it into a successful working farm. He was a fair employer who was highly respected by everyone who met him. After almost 30 years, owing to his increasingly declining health, Lord William decided to sell Woodhouse. For the first time in nearly 800 years, Woodhouse left the family. As the Beresfords, the Uniacs and the Fitzgeralds could all trace their origins to the same family tree. In 1971, the estate was sold to John McCubrey. However, in 1972, the domain changed hands again. The new owner, John Rohan, undertook renovations at the house and built some new additions within the walled garden. He also installed the magnificent period gate at the main entrance. In 1983, John Rowan sold Woodhouse to Pinmere Company, which appointed Dr John O'Connell as the custodian of the estate. It came up for sale again in 2006. It was bought by two Irish businessmen, Aidan Farrell and Charles O'Reilly Highland. However, their development plans did not come to fruition and in 2012, Woodhouse came on the market again. Jim Thompson's ancestors had emigrated from Waterford to the United States in the mid-1800s. On a holiday in Ireland and a trip down memory lane in County Waterford, Jim saw and fell in love with Woodhouse Estate. He and his wife Sally bought the estate in 2012 and immediately began crucial restoration works to the endangered structure of the listed main house. They also restored the six close to derelict cottages. The 17th century stone bridge over the River Tay was also renovated, as was the large crumbling walled garden. The extensive 18th century woods were cared for once more. This passionate endeavour took six years to complete. New features were also added, the tennis pavilion, the garden room, and the so-called little wood house, a children's hut next to an old moss house on the top of the mound. The late 18th century stables were converted into the Woodhouse Museum, where the history of the Woodhouse estate and the families who lived and worked here is researched and documented. Woodhouse, a home to many creatures, great and small. Sees an Aberdeen Angus herd thriving on the cliff grasslands overlooking the Celtic Sea. 
along with the red deer, sheep, donkeys and so many other domestic and wild species. The story of Woodhouse is the story of two interwoven searches. A long and winding quest by a home for devoted guardians to restore and cherish her natural splendour, to protect her stones amidst the trees. And a search by Jim and Sally Thompson for their sole friend. There, Anam Karan.